This morning's reading is taken from Ruth 2, verses 17 to 23. So Ruth gleaned in the field until evening. Then she freshed the barley she had gathered, and it amounted to about an ephah. She carried it back to town, and her mother-in-law saw how much she had gathered. Ruth also brought out and gave her what she had left over after she had eaten enough. Her mother-in-law asked her, Where did you glean today? Where did you work? Blessed be the man who took notice of you. Then Ruth told her mother-in-law about the one whose place she had been working. The name of the man I work with today is Boaz, she said. The Lord bless him, Naomi said to her daughter-in-law. He has not stopped showing his kindness to the living and the dead, she added. That man is our close relative. He is one of our guardian redeemers. Then Ruth the Moabite said, He even said to me, Stay with my workers until they finish harvesting all my grain. Naomi said to Ruth, her daughter-in-law, It will be good for you, my daughter, to go with the woman who, who work for him, because in whom so, someone else's field you might be harmed. So Ruth stayed close to the women of Boaz to glean until the barley and wheat harvests were finished, and she lived with her mother-in-law. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Mark. So it's great to have Sam with us today. Um, Hello. <laughs> Obviously, we want to hear what you've got to say to us this morning, but it'd be great to hear, how are you? I'm good. Yeah, I'm good. Yeah. Good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, yeah I, I've got a lot of information in my head. It's yeah. been a very intense few weeks. Um, a lot of the information, really, in fairness, is just words that people in the North use. Like, I mean, there, are, with that. there are so many. For years, I thought pants were what you wore under your trousers. No. no. Pants are trousers. You do um, realise I can totally help you with this. <laughs> you have to send me like a word of the day yeah, of the yeah, day. Yeah, yeah. yeah. See, that makes sense when you think about it. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, so yeah, most of my time is spent trying to figure out Northern what blessing. people are saying. Yeah. Um, Bless yeah. you. Um, is there anything in particular we can be praying for you in the next few weeks? Um, Other than understanding northernness. I just think energy. It's a really, really... Uh, physically into we, we, a lot of it's classroom based um there's a lot of stuff to learn um and a lot of stuff you have to get right obviously um so yeah just sort of uh, energy and um yeah you can do that definitely well let's pray for you now before you're gonna share your word with us today Lord God, we just thank you for Sam, and we thank you uh, for the, the joy that he brings to this place, actually, every time he's here. Um, and Lord, we just thank you that you've put something on his heart to share today, and we pray that you'll be with him in, his, in your spirit, and that he would hear what it is that you think is most important about what he's got, and be really clear about the direction you want him to go. Um, thank you for all the preparation that he's done, um, and the listening to you. So yeah, we just help pray that you would give us open ears to, to hear what it is that you have to say to us today through Sam. Amen. Good morning. Thank you for having me back. Um, I'm very grateful that you've let me come and speak. I'm very aware that you've probably just finished breathing like a, the sigh of relief of me leaving. Um, <laughs> and in, I, in fairness, I didn't think I was going to be back quite this quickly. Um, I genuinely thought I was preaching in November and had put it in my diary, and I got a text from Andy last week saying, you're preaching next Sunday, right? And I was like, all right. So <laughs> here I am. Um, so it's been a little bit last minute. My thoughts are a little bit scatty, more so than normal. I'm aware that my thoughts are normally a little bit scatty, but they are a bit more today, basically as a result of my own catastrophic incompetence at managing a diary. Um, so my main takeaway from this point, my moral point today is, if you are, if you've got preaching commitments... Make sure they're correct in your diary, because uh, otherwise you end up where I was yesterday afternoon trying to, you know. So a lot of, I'm basically relying fully on God today, which I should be doing all the time, but especially today, because uh, I did not have much to share. Um, the book of Ruth, 
is genuinely one of my favorite ones in the Bible. Um, and I don't know how many times you've heard a preacher say that. This is my favorite. This is my favorite. Sometimes I think it's kind of because they want you to listen to what they're going to say. Um, but I really love this book simply because it is, it's just that. It's simple. Um, there is very little politics. There's no real betrayal. There's no backstabbing. Um, it's simply a story of how kindness and loyalty can make an enormous impact on the life of an individual. And you see a lot in the news and in social media and, and in adverts about how there are heroes who save lots of people um, and give millions of pounds and la- to help large numbers of people. And, and I don't in any way want to diminish the value of that. But sometimes I think we can get so focused on the big picture that we lose perspective on individuals. Like those people at church and in our communities who we know need help. And, and I wonder whether how often we kind of stop looking at the far distance and we just check the person stood next to us. So just take a second to look at the person to your left or right and say, how are you doing? Because, actually, I think sometimes we forget that. Um, and today we are collecting food for the, for the food bank. And I believe, you know, I've seen firsthand the impact that uh, and the value that the food bank has on families, that has on young people. So for everyone that's been able to donate, thank you very much for doing that because um, it makes a massive impact on people's lives. Now, to give you a short summary of where we are in the story, and it's going to be short because we are running short of time. Um, And I ran over this morning, and I kept getting looks from Andy. Um, uh, I've been ignoring him for years. I'm not going to start listening to him now. Um, Ruth is a Moabite woman uh, who is related by marriage to Naomi, her mother-in-law. And tragically, Naomi's husband and both her sons die, leaving herself and Ruth as widows. Um, And now instead of leaving uh, Naomi and remaining in Moab, which probably would have been a sensible option, um, Ruth decides to stay with Naomi and return to Bethlehem. Now in chapter two, we see Ruth and Naomi trying to figure out how they are going to eat and survive. And and we hear how God rewards Ruth's faithfulness uh, in providing all of their needs. Now, Ruth goes to a local field and asks the foreman if she can glean the wheat. And and this basically means picking up the bits of barley that are dropped during the reaping process. And it just so happened that the field belonged to to a relative of Elimelech, which is Ruth's father-in-law. And he identified who she was and instructed her to come back to his field every day of the harvest and to pick as much as she wanted. And on the first day, this amounted to an ephah, which is basically 22 litres of barley. And I didn't have much of a metric for what 22 litres was. So I kind of thought, what do I know about? And I was like, I know about beer. And there's barley in beer, and there's like two pints in a litre, which means that in 22 litres, that's like 44 pints, which in my mind feels like a lot of barley for one day. I couldn't drink 44 pints in one day. I'm also not advocating that you should, to be clear. Don't... (laughs) Maybe 44 pints of water. Um... And <laughs> this is what I'm talking about. <laughs> and he also forbade his men from harassing her and ensured that she was fed and looked after. Boaz didn't need to go to this extent. He simply showed kindness. Now, later on in the story, their relationship does progress. And I love this story. Uh, and we haven't got time to talk about it at the moment, and we learn about the concept of the family redeemer. Um, but what I want to focus on is their relationship in this story and, and two main things that their characters represent. Firstly, I want to look at Boaz and the impact of kindness and generosity. I want you to have a think. Who here can remember a time where somebody was kind of out of the blue, completely just kind? And thoughtful. Because I think we can probably all think of a time which that person would have felt completely inconsequential, but for us made a massive difference. And and the example that I want to share of this was over the summer whilst I was working at New Wine, I had one particular day that was genuinely awful. 
We'd been working like 16 hour days. Uh, I was sleep deprived. I was stressed. We were going from like case to case on site. I was walking about 30,000 steps a day. And I just had a conversation with this family, which was genuinely one of the most heartbreaking stories I'd ever heard. And I just wanted to cry. And around the corner walked a man named John. Now, I hadn't seen John in about three or four years. Uh, but John and his wife Liz are, are two extremely significant people in my life. When I first moved out when I was 18, I'd broken my leg and I'd never lived away from home and I was quite terrified, really. And, and when I moved, I moved in with this couple from the church called John and Liz. And I couldn't drive, so Liz would kind of take me to hospital appointments and she would remind me to like do my washing. There's a lot of things that happen before you turn 18 that just sort of happen and then you move out and you get your own place and a lot of those things stop happening um and I needed to be reminded to do some of those things now as a 25 year old man obviously I never forget to do these things you know like putting preaching commitments in my diary and all of that sort of thing um and around the corner walked John and, and John and Liz kind of became like a second set of parents to me really making sure that I was okay and and, and keeping me going and John walked around that corner and he looked at me and he gave me this big smile and he just pulled me into this really, really tight hug. He had no idea what was going on, what I'd just listened to. And he said to me, I was just thinking about you and I just wanted to let you know that you're doing a really good job. And that interaction lasted possibly 30 seconds, but genuinely, completely transformed my mood, my day, the way I was going about what we were doing. And I think everybody probably has someone like, some situation like that. And maybe you've done that. You've done something that you believe to be completely inconsequential. And actually for someone it has completely changed the game. And this is kind of what I think this story in Ruth is about. In, in a period of, of the history of God's people when they were frankly in a state of complete chaos. Like, they do not come out of the book of Judges looking great as a group of people. Um, and then you've got one Samuel, and again, there's, kind of, there's more chaos. And nestled between those two books is this seemingly insignificant story about a small, down-on-their-luck family and how some simple acts of kindness and compassion completely changed the trajectory of their lives. And in verse, I have to apologise to Mark, and I had to do this this morning. The reading that was read this morning, because I didn't think throughout what I was talking about properly, not totally relevant, because I'm not talking about that part of the passage. But it's great, and you've all got to hear a lovely part of the story, so, you know, fantastic. But in verse 15, Boaz instructs his workers as follows. Let her gather grain from right uh, amongst the sheaves without stopping her, and pull out some heads of barley from the bundles and drop them on purpose for her. Let them pick let her pick them up and do not give her any trouble. Now, Boaz is not making an enormous public gesture here. He's not saying, look at me, look what I've done. I'm helping people. He's not posting like a photo with him and Ruth, like holding a sheath of barley on Instagram saying, hashtag blessed her. You know, it's not, it's not contrived. It's a very simple, quiet conversation he has with his staff. Not making it obvi obvious, but delivering genuine, practical, and caring support for someone in need. Bless you. And it would probably have been really embarrassing for her to be in that position, coming from a, a being you know, in a family, having money, and then suddenly having to beg for food. But that doesn't even come into it. Boaz shows complete respect to her. And, and I think, as an aside... In a society where showing respect for people seems to be like a, a novelty. In a situation where he had complete power over the situation. He could have humiliated her. He just chose to show respect. Now, the other thing that I want to focus on is, is kind of more based around Ruth's character. She shows an extraordinary amount of resilience in this story. Herself and Naomi have gone through an unbelievable amount of personal trauma, losing their husbands, and in Naomi's case, she lost both of her children as well. And they decided to head back to Jerusalem, no, sorry, to Bethlehem. And 
at the time, that was an incredibly challenging journey. I looked at it, and it's like 50 miles, and I was like, pish posh, easy. Can do that, no problem. Not walking, obviously, I'd drive. But at the time, <laughs> at the time, they had to walk. And as far as I'm aware, timber and boots did not exist. They didn't have boots. And so it was a really, really difficult journey. And they knew that when they arrived, they wouldn't have a home, and they wouldn't have any food, and they wouldn't have any income. Being, being a, a widow at that time was an incredibly vulnerable position to be in. You had no money coming in. You didn't have the protection that being in a family unit offered. And instead of having a future in Moab that would have been more secure, she chose to remain faithful to Naomi. And I feel like that we all probably identify with Ruth to some degree in this story. And it might not be the same degree, you know. But actually, in our eyes, something that is like a small thing or a big thing might be different in someone else's eyes. They might look at it and go, oh my goodness, some of the stuff they're dealing with is massive. And you might go, well, it's just Tuesday. But I want to try and contextualize it. And I don't know if you've ever been on a camping trip where it's like raining before you leave. And you arrive and you set up your tent. We've had experiences like this at Soul Survivor. You set up your tent and it's raining and your shoes are wet and the, it's really windy and your sandwiches have got wet and, and then in the night your bed deflates and it's wet and, and you just go, do you know what? I'm going to go home. I can't be bothered with this. I've got a bed at home. I've got Netflix. I've got a kettle that you don't have to like turn everything else off to use. I've got an actual fridge, not one of those like ice boxes where everything just goes moldy anyway and so you just start to go home and then you get in the car and you're halfway home and then the sun comes out and the clouds roll back and it's glorious for days and I think when you're in that situation you just get to the point where you want to give up now I want to caveat this by saying sometimes things happen in our lives that do need to stop sometimes you are not in the right place or you're not in the right relationship or the right job and you do just need to walk away I've, I've been there I've been in a position where it's been really really painful and I've taken a lot of time to think about it but I've had to walk away from a relationship or, or a job or whatever it is and it's really painful and it takes an enormous amount of courage and if that's something that you are going through please come and chat to me because I would love to pray with you about it but maybe you just feel like you haven't got the energy to go one more step. You haven't got the energy for the hard work. You, you just want to give up. And, and as we see, Ruth is given a lifeline, but it doesn't come without work. She's cleaning the field. That, that's, that's not easy physical labor. She's having to get stuck in. And she goes out to the field and she finds a job and she puts the effort in. And I feel like it's sometimes like that with, with us and God, you know, he's supporting us through a difficult situation, but in that he's giving us the opportunity to help ourselves. In Matthew 11, verses 28 to 30, it says, Come to me, all who labour and are heavy burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. I am gentle and lowly in heart. Hello. For I am gentle and lowly in heart. And you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And in this passage, you know, he's not saying that there is no burden or no work. But he's saying that if you do it with him, it will be easier to bear. I don't know if anyone has seen the film Evan Almighty. Yeah. I love it. Um, objectively, it's not a great film. Okay. The CGI on the raccoons leaves a little bit to be desired. But I truly believe that it has some of the best like nuggets of wisdom in it in any film you will find. And actually, to that point, I, was, I wrote this yesterday and then immediately came downstairs and said to my mum and dad, we are watching Evan Almighty this evening, so we watched it. And there is a scene in that film where Evan's wife, Joan, is basically at breaking point in their marriage. She wants to leave him. She is fed up because basically in her mind, he's gone mental. And she encounters God, represented by uh, Morgan Freeman, in a restaurant. And she doesn't know that it's God at this point. And he says to her, 
let me ask you something. When someone asks for patience, do you think God gives them patience or gives them the opportunity to be patient? If they prayed for courage, do you think God gives them courage or the opportunity to be courageous? And my favourite one, if someone prays for their family to be closer or to get along better, do you think he zaps them with a warm, fuzzy feeling or do you think he gives them opportunities to love each other? And every time I hear that, it's like, oh, because sometimes I think we could all be forgiven for thinking when you pray to God, it's going to be like the genie from Aladdin. He's going to be like, zap, courage. Or there's some patience. Let me just go to my bag. I think I've got patience in stock. But actually, the reality is, if you're in a situation at work and there's someone who's really irritating you, and believe me, I've worked with Jake. <laughs> I understand workplace frustration. <laughs> like there's sometimes you just want to throw a mug at someone. No, I'm joking. Jake is wonderful. Um, and do you think that God is just, you're just going to feel a little, blah, 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 and then you go, oh, oh, goodness, I feel patient today. No, chances are something is going to happen and there's going to be a moment where you can say, do you know what, it's fine. Or you can absolutely lose it. And so I think, for us it's a challenge that are we looking for God to solve our problems are we looking for the opportunity to solve our problems with God there's a lot of passages in scripture where God is or Jesus is referred to as Emmanuel and that means God with us God is for us God is with us but God wants to do things in partnership with us God doesn't need us I've gone totally off script here God doesn't need us but God wants us And he gives us skills and he gives us gifts and he gives us opportunity to do stuff with him. So as I finish up, I just want you to think about where you fit into this story. Do you have a short temper? Do you just need to be a bit more kind, a bit more generous sometimes, a bit more loving? To to be in a position where you can demonstrate what you believe to be a seemingly insignificant act of kindness that genuinely might actually save someone's life? Or do you kind of need the inspiration and the resilience shown by Ruth to stay faithful and to stay the course, trusting that God God has a plan to better you? So I'm just going to pray as I finish. Dear Lord Jesus, thank you uh, that you bless us with stories like this. The stories that are appearing consequential but actually represent massive value in your eyes and I pray that if we're in situations that aren't right that we will find courage and find opportunities to be courageous to step out of them but I pray that if you think God is calling you to stay somewhere that we will find the opportunities to be courageous and patient and loving and kind in those situations so I just pray come Holy Spirit I feel like God's really been doing stuff today. Um, and I just want to encourage you to keep pressing into that as we sing our final song. But also afterwards, you know, the prayer ministry team are around and they're fantastic and they want to pray with you. And there are other people here that will want to pray with you. Um, so, yes, yeah, just as we finish worshiping, I just pray, come Holy Spirit. In your precious name. Amen.